good morning. Uh, wa welcome to QCAM webinar number uh, 47. My name is Yu Zhang, and I'm working as a staff scientist at QCAM. Today, our, our topic is about the easy spectrum suite. Uh, it's a, a, a spectroscopy uh, modeling template developed in uh, Professor Anna Gridloff group at the University of Southern California. Uh, first, please allow me to introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Sama uh, Gossam is a assistant professor of chemistry at the Georgia State University. He completed uh, his bachelor's degree in uh, chemistry in 2008 at uh, the American University of Beirut in Lebanon and obtained his uh, PhD in photochemical science in 2013 at the Bowling Green State University. While he worked with uh, uh, Professor M Massimo uh, Olivici on modeling biological uh, photoreceptors with hybrid QM MM uh, method, he then carried out his postdoc study at the University of Southern California with Professor Anna Krenov. While he worked on modeling photo ionization and the photo detachment process, uh, he joined the faculty at Georgia State University in 2017. His research interests uh, include using both classical and uh, quantum mechanics to study light responsive chemical and the biological system. All right. Thank you very much, um, you and, and Kuan Yi, for the um, invitation and, and for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be able to have this opportunity to talk a little bit about, um, in large part, what I've done during my, my postdoc with um, Dr. Anna Krilov. Um, and, and this is work that I'm, I'm hoping to um, continue um, developing these um, methods, and, and we definitely use them quite a lot in our lab as well. So the idea of this talk is, is really to just introduce these um, tools. They've actually been around for some time, so it, it's not um, a, a completely new tool, but we keep updating it and we keep adding new um, implementations and, and, and updates. And so this is a, a sort of an update um, on what's new as well in those codes. And after that, um, I will talk about two programs within the suite, which is really what makes up the suite at the moment for, for the most part, um, uh, which are Easy FCF and easy dice and, and and those will be really sort of two mini tutorials on how to use these programs what the input looks like um and some tips and tricks on on how to use them to get um accurate frank condom factors and and photoionization spectra so let's start with the introduction now of course if you have a a molecule that you want to learn something about these molecules are tiny, that they're um, angstroms or, or they're um, nanometers um, in size, and you cannot obviously see them with the naked eye, so you have to use some way of communicating with those molecules. And the best way that we really have at the moment to, to communicate with these molecules is by shining light on them and looking at the resulting um, the light that passes through them and, and analyzing it to see what has been absorbed, what has been emitted, et cetera. So you get a spectrum on the other end, um, and that spectrum contains a lot of information. Now, if you give this spectrum to a trained experimental spectroscopist, already they can look at this and tell you quite a bit about the molecule. They might be able to tell you where the onset of the um, of the peak is, and, and that peak corresponds to the adiabatic excitation energy. So they tell you something about the energetics of the excited states of these molecules, if this is an excitation spectrum, um, or if it's another, if it's an infrared spectrum, they can tell you about the energetics of the vibrational motions of these bonds, et cetera, right? So there are many different types of spectroscopies with varying 
um, energies and, and varying densities that lead to a lot of different um, types of spectroscopies, not to mention angle resolved spectroscopies and, and um, time resolved spectroscopies, et cetera, and multi photon spectroscopies. But the spectrum actually contains potentially a lot more information that even a trained spectroscopist might not be able to glean from this. So they might look at the spectrum and tell you, well, this is clearly a alcohol or um, it's a conjugated molecule, um, it's a aromatic ring, et cetera. But they won't be able to look at the spectrum very likely and tell you exactly the conformational state that the molecule is in. They won't be able to tell you um, the exact bond lengths and angles that this molecule um, takes and in, in this um, phase that is, it is in. So that's where computational modeling is extremely important. And, and you can take your favorite visualization software, build your, your molecule, run it through your favorite computational chemistry program. Uh, we all know, since this is a QCAM webinar, that um, that's a hint to which one is our favorite. Um, you, you get the wave function and the energetics of um, the states. That information is, of course, incredibly useful, and it gives you the key elements that you can use in order to then go ahead and simulate the spectrum computationally. Um, and using the simulated spectrum, if your the spectrum matches with your experimental one, already that's a confirmation that the molecule that you built is a at least very closely resembles the one that's in the experiment and you can go back and run all types of uh, analyses on the um, wave function and, and get a lot more information about this so you really get introduced to um, phenol and, and you um, get to um, talk to phenol about the uh, bonds and angles. You get the deciphered message that was encrypted in the experimental spectrum that was hidden in these peaks and intensities that you couldn't get before. Now, how do you simulate the spectrum from this? Well, this is um, easy spectrum. That's the idea of this. It's a post quantum mechanical um, calculation that takes the information from a quantum mechanical. Um, output and uses it to then go ahead and account for things like experimental details in order to simulate the spectrum given some specific set of conditions. Let me see. Yep. So uh, the, the starting point for, for this being able to simulate the spectrum is the transition dipole moment. The transition dipole moment has um, the key elements of the initial wave function, which contains all the information about the system um, in its initial state, both in terms of the electronic coordinates, which are in red, and the nuclear coordinates, which are in blue, and your final wave function, which contains all the information about your target state um, that you end up with. Usually, your initial state is some ground state, and your target state is an excited state, but that's uh, not necessarily the case. It could be an ionized state. Um, your initial state might be an excited state itself or some multi configurational state. Now, using some separable ansatz, such as the Born Oppenheimer approximation, you can express these full wave functions in terms of an electronic wave function multiplied by a nuclear wave function. So you separate it into two terms. And within the Born Oppenheimer approximation, you can say that the um, electronic wave function depends only parametrically on R. So you're able to integrate it out and get a electronic transition dipole moment, which is um, the term mu if, shown at the bottom um, in, in black. And if you do that, you're left with the probability of the transition, which is PIF, being proportional to your nuclear wave function initial belonging to some vibrational state. So the, these decorations, which are the prime and the double prime tell you which vibrational state you're in, um, in the initial state and the final state respectively. And the, um, the, trans the electronic dipole moment mu if is now 
in principle, uh, geometry dependent. It depends on the nuclear coordinates. You can go one step further and, and use the content approximation where you say that the mu if depends only weakly on r and therefore you can just compute it at the equilibrium structure re and as a result you end up with the um, um, mu being taken out of the integral that makes your life a lot easier and your blue term now is what we call the frank condon factors that are essentially just an overlap integral between the vibrational states of your initial state which is your let's say your ground state and your final state vibrational levels. So let's translate, whoops, let's translate all of this uh, math into a uh, picture and try to make sense of it. So your vibrational initial state is shown here in red. Um, using a harmonic approximation, we can plot all of these ground and excited states or initial and target states in, um, uh, in, in as harmonic potentials and use the um, harmonic wave function to find what the um, uh, what the eigenstates of these harmonic potentials look like. So your ground state is simply this Gaussian shaped curve. When you take this and check its overlap with all of the vibrational levels of the target states, that overlap is what determines your intensity of each vibronic transition. So if you have a strong overlap between the zero, zero transition, then that transition will be the um, strongest as you do here in the green. And if you have a stronger vibrational overlap like you do here with the new, um, new uh, prime is equal to two state, then that is the most intense speed. Typically, when your excited state or your target state is strongly displaced with respect to your initial state, then your most intense peak would be um, one of the higher ex vibrational excited states of the target state. On the other hand, if you are in, um, in a state which is not that strongly displaced, like this green one, which the displacement is very small, then your zero, zero overlap is the one that's going to be the strongest. So you get your main progression by looking at the um, overlap of the initial state, lowest energy vibration with all of the vibrational levels of the um, target states. In case you have a um, some thermal energy that allows higher vibrational states of the ground state to get occupied, then you just check the overlap of this initial state with all of these um, uh, vibrational levels of the target states and you get the hot bands. By combining the main progression and the hot bands, you end up essentially getting your spectrum, which you can then broaden and get the vibrational structure or the vibronic structure of your spectrum. This could be a UV vis spectrum, or this could be a photoelectron spectrum. The idea is exactly the same. Now, I've labeled here, here three types of energies that are typically used um, in, in the quantum uh, or the uh, computational community. One is the vertical excitation energy that's from the bottom of the initial state well to wherever it hits the electronic energy of the um, target state. And this is um, widely used to, to represent the highest vibrational, the most intense vibrational level. This is justified by the uh, Frank Condon principle, but this is not always necessarily the case. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. So um, this does not correspond to any experimental observable. It's a, um, it's a theoretical number that has some correspondence to um, to lambda max, but it's not directly related. You also have your adiabatic electronic energy, which is the difference in the energy between the bottom of the two wells. And you have your adiabatic excitation energy as opposed to the electronic excitation energy. So this is the zero zero transition. That's the energy difference between the um, lowest vibrational energy levels of the initial and target state. 
The only difference between those two is that it, it, it includes the differences in the vibrational energy levels of the initial and target state. So let's look at an example of this. This is a simulation using easy FCF back when it was called easy spectrum. And um, you, you have the phenolate ion. This is the zero zero transition over here. Um, the reason that you have a lower energy transition than your zero zero transition is because this was simulated at a higher temperature um, and this corresponds to a so-called hot band like you do over here. So the, the hot band contributes to this. But your zero zero transition um, is, um, is the lowest energy transition from the lowest vibrational energy level of the ground state. In the case of phenolate, your electronic adiabatic energy is very close to your um, zero, zero. That is an indication that your ground and excited state, or ground and ionized state rather in, in this case, are um, having the same zero point vibrational energy. Your vertical transition is off by about 0.05 electron volts and does not correspond to the most intense peak. Right? Here's a more extreme example. Um, this is Flavin, and we looked at the zero, zero transition, which is out here, uh, the electronic adiabatic energy, and there's quite a difference between those two. It's also about 0 0.05, but this is just the difference in the zero point vibrational energy. And your vertical transition is much, higher in energy, it's about 0.4 off. Depending on whether you simulate the spectrum in a protein or in the gas phase, um, you, you actually will, um, will get different transitions being the bright ones. So um, in, in the protein, this is the brightest transition in the gas phase simulation, which is the solid red line, which we simulated. Um, this is the brightest transition. And this tells you that um, at least in the gas phase spectrum, your vertical excitation energy is off by around 0.4. Um, whereas if you look at the protein spectrum, where this is the most intense vibrational band, neither the adiabatic nor the vertical excitations are the correct ones. You actually need to simulate the um, the Frank Condon factors in order to get the lambda max correctly for the UV vis absorption of the first excited state of lumiflavin. So the solution, the, in solution, the same answer applies. So in solution, we also were not able to simulate the vertical, uh, the um, lambda max using the vertical and adiabatic. We only could do it when we accounted for the um, Frank Condon factors like we did here. And uh, that's a notable example where really the Frank Condon factors were, were important for um, uh, for simulating the absorption spectrum of Flavin. We were not the first to to, to find this out. It's actually um, been around for for a while. So that tells you about the Frank Condon factors. What about this electronic transition dipole moment? Well, that just tells you the probability of exciting from one electronic state to the other without thinking about the Frank Condon factor. So this tells you the probability of exciting to each vibrational state within the target states, but this just gives you the probability of exciting to that uh, state in the first place. That's the electronic probability to get your total probability of the transition. Um, now, this is something that's probably familiar to many of you because it's computed for excitations to bound states, it's computed automatically in QCHEM or in any electronic structure package, at least most of them, would give you this number automatically. Um, you can use this. There's many different ways of expressing this um, electronic transition dipole moment. You can express it as a cross section. You can express it as an oscillator strength. You can express it as an Einstein coefficient. You can even mathematically relate the transition dipole moment to an experimental quantity, which is the extinction coefficient. So all of those different ways of measuring the absorption intensity are actually closely related. They're mathematically related um, within 
usually some some constants or sometimes it's a little bit more involved than just a, a bunch of constants but um, it is quite simple to um, to convert from one to the other however when you talk about ionization things are a little bit different it's no longer like exciting to a bound state because now the final state for one of your electrons is no longer another bound orbital it's a continuum orbital. It's a free electron that left the molecule or, your, or, or the atom. And therefore, this integration becomes a little bit complicated because you cannot express this, at least not easily, in terms of a um, uh, linear combination of basis functions. This function is continuous. It, it keeps going. Um, and you need a bigger and bigger expansion of, uh, of basis set functions in order to capture it um, which uh, there, there is a way to do that, but um, it's tricky, right? Therefore, um, we, we need to think about how to calculate this equation. Essentially, what this is telling you is you need your initial wave function, which is a function of all the electron coordinates and parametric, parametrically depending on your nuclear coordinates. And when you excite the light, or excite the system with light, you kick out an electron, and that electron is described by your photoelectron wave function. There is an approximation you can do, luckily, to make this solving this integral easier. Um, since the electrons are indistinguishable, and because you can assume that the photoelectron wave function is orthogonal to all the molecular orbitals of the system, you can now do this integration in two steps. The first step is to integrate over all the bound orbitals or all the bound states, um, let's say. So um, if you do that, you're, you're taking your initial bound state and your final state, which is missing one electron now, and you integrate over all of the electrons except the one that was ionized. As a result, you end up with a one electron property that is called the Dyson orbital. You take this Dyson orbital and you plug it back into this equation. Now you got rid of all of these red terms and you're left with just the blue terms, which are depending on only the electron that was ionized. Essentially what you're doing is you're replacing this full electron wave function with just the Dyson orbital that describes the initial state of the electron before it was ionized. You can now use this to compute some property, which we'll talk about in a minute. So this is what we really care about. Um, so that's why we're doing this. Let's think about this for a minute and what this means. Um, this Dyson orbital in Koopman's theorem, where all of the orbitals are exactly the same in the initial and final state, except that one, which is now missing, that Dyson orbital corresponds to simply the Hartree-Fock canonical orbital that was vacated by the electron. So it's, it's the um, wave function of that electron in the molecule. The problem is that within Koopman's theorem, you're ignoring orbital relaxation, which is the changing shape of these orbitals upon ionization, and you're missing electron correlation as well. So that's where you can use other methods, including equation of motion coupled cluster, but including also Cassie 2 Green's function theory, except um, we use, of course, equation of motion coupled cluster. The Dyson orbitals are implemented in, in QChem, um, and we use this for, for two reasons. One is um, it accounts for orbital relaxation electron correlation, um, but this is also a flexible framework for computing ionization, not only from closed shell molecules, but also from open shell molecules, excited states, and multi-configurational weight functions. So um, th this is the idea um, for, uh, for using this Dyson orbital formalism. Now, I said we're doing this essentially to be able to compute this property. What exactly is this property? This is called the differential cross-section. It's just a bunch of constants multiplied by this photoelectron dipole matrix element that is the integral we're interested in. Really, this is the equivalent of the transition dipole moment, except it's for photoionization. Why is this quantity useful? Well, first of all, this is the, the sigma corresponds to the cross-section, so this is the uh, cross-section per solid angle. So this is telling you how the cross-section varies as your solid angle, which is the angle that the photoelectron leaves the molecule, um, what it looks like. If you integrate this over all the solid angles, you end up getting your absolute photoionization or photodetachment cross-section. 
photoionization if you're talking about a neutral system, photo detachment if you're talking about an ionized system. Um, but if you don't integrate this, this alone can actually give you more information because it gives you your photoelectron angular distribution. This tells you what direction the electron leaves in with respect to your polarization of light. It has this form, and um, this equation, at least it has this form in the case of a randomly oriented molecule. So when you have a sample where the molecules are not aligned in any way, then this is the form of, of the angular distribution. Um, and it's characterized completely by this one constant beta, which ranges from negative one to two, negative one being one extreme of being completely perpendicular, per, um, beta is equal to two being the other extreme, which is just completely parallel, and beta equals zero, meaning that the electron leaves the molecule in, with an equal probability at all different directions with respect to depolarization of light. So why is this informative? Let's look at a simple example. H minus is um, the first one. In H minus, you take your, your um, electron is initially in an S orbital, so that's your Dyson orbital, and your polarization of light, let's say by convention, is along the z-axis, your photoelectron wave function would have to be in the same direction, just by symmetry, in order to conserve the symmetry of this transition dipole moment um, integral. And you can probably recognize this as just being the selection rule for atoms. So from an H minus, you end up getting a, um, a P wave, as we call it, because you get a um, electron coming out parallel to the um, direction of polarization of, of the light. What if you start with a p orbital? Well, classically, you might expect that it's exactly the same thing. You're polarizing the electron along the z-axis. It should leave along um, the, the z-axis, but that's not what happens. Instead, according to our selection rule, as probably many of you expect, um, this is going to be either an S wave or a D wave. But now the question is which, to which the answer is, um, it, it could be either. And in fact, it, while for H minus, you have only a P wave at any energy, it doesn't matter which energy you ionize the system, you always get a P wave. Um, in the case of the F minus, you end up getting a S wave at very low energies, a D wave at high energies where the beta starts to approach two, but at intermediate energies, you get, due to the cross terms between S and D um, orbitals you, uh, or functions, you end up getting a perpendicular distribution, distribution of the photoelectron. So you go from isotropic to perpendicular to parallel, depending on the energy. And this is incredibly informative because this has, contains a lot of information about the shape of the orbital. It tells you if it's an S-shaped, D-wave, D-shaped, or P-shaped, or something else. But it also tells you um, information about the size of, um, of the, the diffuseness of, of the orbital, right? So if you have a, a very diffuse orbital, you might expect that this is going to be delayed or is going to happen sooner, etc. right? So um, you, you get different contributions uh, from S and D waves, depending on the shape of your molecular orbital that you started with. Of course, the problem with computing this is being able to compute the photoelectron wave function. So in order to be able to do this, you need the photoelectron wave function. In our implementation, which is an easy Dyson, we use either a plane wave, which is simply a solution to the Schrodinger equation with just a kinetic operator, or a Coulomb wave, which includes a, um, a term for electrostatic interaction with a positive charge Z. Uh, we can express both of those in terms of partial spherical waves using so-called plane wave expansion. These are spherical harmonics and these are radial functions. The radial functions are what differ for the plane wave and the Coulomb wave. So here it's a Bessel function. Um, here it's a so-called Coulomb radial wave function. And Built into this equation is the Z. If you put Z is equal to zero here, or Z is equal to zero, um, then 
that will give you um, the exact same answer as using a plane wave. So this collapses to a spherical Bessel function if you place zero for the chart. So the, again, coming back to the purpose of this talk, we're introducing two codes, Easy FCF and Easy Dyson. Easy FCF calculates Frank condom factors that yield vibrational progressions. Um, this requires frequency calculations for the initial and target states. I'll show you in a minute how that looks. Whereas Easy Dyson calculates absolute cross sections, photoelectron angular distributions and beta anisotropy, and requires a Dyson orbital computed um, from a electronic structure software package. The, both of those codes are written in C++. They're open source. They're distributed under GPL. They're available here. We just uploaded a, a new version of both codes. Um, this formerly was Easy Spectrum, so we, we renamed it. So this is now version one of Easy FCF, whereas we just released version five of Easy Dyson. Let's talk about Easy FCF. Um, now, this picture is one dimensional, but of course, we know that for multi, for polyatomic uh, molecules, we have a multi dimensional problem where we have to think about how to treat this. Um, of course, the vibrational wave function of the initial state can be expressed in terms of the product of the one dimensional harmonic oscillator for each state each expressed in terms of the coordinates, the normal mode coordinates or the normal coordinates of the, um, of the initial state. The exact same for the target state, but the problem is that those normal coordinates may be different. These normal coordinates are um, uh, expressed in terms of the normal mode of the initial state. These normal uh, coordinates are expressed in terms of the normal mode of the target state. So how do we deal with these two different normal modes? Well, there's the easy solution, which is just assume that they're parallel. If we assume they're the same, then you can just pick one. You can pick either the initial or the target. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a bit. And then you express your integral in terms of the um, coordinates of the initial state. And your final state is just then displaced along some displacement vector along Q. Um, in this case. Or you can try to rotate or transform using the Tushinsky transformation, the um, vibrational state of the target state to align with the um, those of the initial state or in terms of the initial state. All right, so let's jump into it and, and see what the input looks like. Um, if you have um, the first thing that you need to enter for an easy FCF calculation is the temperature. If you have a zero Kelvin spectrum, that makes your life a lot easier because then you don't need to worry about um, vibrational um, excitations in the initial state and your maximum vibrational excitation in the initial state here can be just set to zero and that saves you quite a bit of time because you don't have to compute all the different integrals between the excited vibration state. But if you have a higher energy or a higher temperature spectrum, then you need to include some maximum vibrational excitation. Um, this could be as small as one if you want to, to check the lowest energy transitions. Um, but if you want to look at higher energy excitations as well, uh, thermal populations, you need to increase this, which is um, increase it from the default value of one. These states are populated according to the Boltzmann factors. Um, and then you have your spectrum intensity threshold. This is just a printout threshold. It's not for calculation. It doesn't change your calculation time. Now, within the parallel approximation, there are several factors that you can play with. And those typically are used to help you reduce the computational cost of your um, of your calculation. Now, in principle, there are an infinite number of initial states, uh, uh, of initial vibrational states, and there are um, an infinite number of uh, vibrational states in your target state. So you need to use some finite number here. Luckily, um, for the initial state, that's determined by your temperature. So if you have a low temperature, you can use zero or one, but if you have a high temperature, you need to increase this. In the case of your target state, this is, um, 
typically not very a very large number because um, this is using a truncated uh, value of um, the uh, max is uh, fine and justified by the small overlap of the highly excited vibrational states in the target state. You combination bands are due to multiple vibrational um, excitations at the same time. Typically, you want this to be turned on unless you want to get a qualitative idea about um, the spectrum. Um, then you want to choose if you want to use the normal coordinates of the target state or the initial state. Now, what does this mean? Remember, I told you earlier that in the parallel approximation, you need to choose which you need to um, express your coordinates in terms of the normal modes, either of the initial or the target state. We recommend choosing the target state. The reason for that is um, in a case where they're not aligned, the initial and target state, most of the time, especially when you have no hot bands, then all of the time, your initial state is in the fully symmetric um, um, state, right? It's in the lowest vibrational state, which doesn't have any nodes. Whereas your, vib your excited target state is going to have multiple nodes or at least one node. So if you rotate the target state to meet with your, or, or to align with your um, initial state, you will get a qualitatively different overlap than you would if you rotate your initial state to um, express it in terms of the um, target state. So this is a good idea to keep this true. Now, what about the Shinsky rotations? When you generate the input, um, the XML input, this is an XML file generated in an easy spectrum. By default, we don't request the Shinsky rotations. So if you do want to, to request them, you have to remove these OPT underscore terms. So by default, they're off. Remember to turn them on if you want them. Um, and other than that, all of these um, keywords are the same as what you had for the um, parallel mode approximation. I forgot to mention, you also have the opportunity to um, exclude some um, normal modes from the excitation. This is especially if you know that that normal mode has a small delta Q and won't contribute to your spectrum or if it's symmetry forbidden and won't have any um, likely transitions. You can also use ener energy thresholds uh, to reduce your computation cost further. After you have the options about the Shinsky rotation and parallel mode approximation, you then have to give your geometry and your normal modes and your frequencies for your um, initial state. So this is um, formaldehyde in this case. There's a script that, of course, automatically generates this XML input from the output of any one of those electronic structure programs. Um, the script takes two or more output files. So it takes the output file of the initial state, but it also does the same for the target state because you need both. Um, you can have target states, in which case you need more than two output files to generate the XML input. Going on, you now have the information about the target state. Um, and, and the target state, you have one more parameter that you really do want to change um, typically, and that is the IP. We call it IP. I actually now have a feeling we, we should change this because this could, this could be excitation energy in the case of a excitation to a bound state, or it could be an ionization energy. Um, so IP is a little bit outdated. Um, th there should be um, the well, ideally, what you want to put in here is the adiabatic excitation energy or the adiabatic ionization energy, the EZ00, because it will assume that what you give it is, is exactly that. The 00, zero transition will have that energy. Um, then you need um, to ensure that your atom ordering in the target state is exactly the same as the initial state. Um, otherwise, you need to use manual atoms reordering. And the same for the normal modes reordering. 
uh, you want to make sure that the order of the frequencies is the same as in the initial state. There's a way to check it in your output. You get the normal mode overlap matrix. You want to make sure this is diagonal. If it's not diagonal, like you have here, where they're off diagonal, you will want to manually reorder these two modes, ideally, in order to get the correct spectrum. The output gives you the uh, aligned molecular coordinates. I'm going to go a little bit faster because I realize that I'm, I'm short on time. You have these coordinates we, which you can actually plot with IQMOL or any other program to check that they are indeed well aligned. And sometimes you have to be careful because if you have methyl groups, your methyl groups might be um, numbered differently. So if you have hydrogen one, two, three, it might overlap with hydrogen two, three, one of the target state and you need to manually rotate that or reorder their numbering in order to make the um, molecular coordinates uh, match. So this is one of the reasons where you get a um, zero spectrum or you get a very bad uh, low intensity spectrum is due to these kinds of issues. You also want to check for parallel mode approximation that this is more or less diagonal and for Dushinsky rotation the quality check is the determinant of S which has to be close to one. The calculation doesn't even run if it's smaller than 0.5. The output will give you the energies, the intensities, which are the squares of the fan condom factors, um, your energies of your vibrational um, states expressed in terms of Kelvin, and the transitions. So this is your zero, zero transition right here. These are hot bands because they're lower in energy. And down here, you have other hot bands, but um, what those show is you're going from one quanta in the zeroth uh, vibrational level of the initial state and one quanta of the first vibrational level of the initial state to three quanta of the um, uh, zeroth <laughs> um, uh, vibrational level of the target state, of the first target state. Right. So um, this is how you read this. Notice that those are all combination bands, right? If you turn off combination bands, then you only get one transition at a time. Let's move on to Easy Dyson. Uh, Easy Dyson computes this um, one electron integral. It does it numerically on a grid. Um, and one of the things that you have to be careful about when using Easy Dyson is how you treat the photoelectron wave function. So um, in order to run an easy Dyson calculation, you first need a Dyson orbital, which you can run in QChem. Um, it's a good idea to always in include the pure cart, just because this ensures that you know what the pure cart is, but also the script looks for this and includes it. If you don't do that, you, you actually have to go in and write in the pure cart yourself, and you might make a mistake. Um, and then you need the CC do Dyson, CC transprop, and you also need to print the, gen the basic set because Easy Dyson looks for it and uses it in the XML input. This is um, the input now of Easy Dyson, the XML input. You have the coordinates, then you have your free electron wave function. Um, this is where you have to think a little bit. The L max, it's a good idea to check that you have a converged L max. When you increase L max, there's no longer any change in your photoelectron. Um, cross sections. Um, however, sometimes you just know because of selection rules that you can stop at a certain point. So if you're looking at ionization from F minus, you can use L max is equal to two because you know from F minus ionization from a P orbital, you only get S waves and D waves and nothing else. Um, then the other part that you have to be careful is, with is the charge of the ionized core. I said you could use a plane wave, which means the Z is equal to zero. That's how you request a plane wave, or a Coulomb wave, where Z is anything else. Um, when do you use zero and when do you use a Coulomb wave? Well, for photo detachment, like in the case of hydride, you definitely want to use a plane wave because when you kick out the electron from H minus, there is no longer whoops, any interaction with your um, with your uh, core. So plane wave is a good approximation. In fact, notice when you use EOM IP Dyson orbitals, you get a pretty good agreement with the experiment. Whereas if you use the Koopman theorem with hartree flock orbitals, you don't. Um, so that's one thing to keep an eye out for as well, is using good 
the quality orbitals to get the right um, absolute photonization uh, cross sections. Now, when you go to helium, again, these are absolute, so they're in terms of four squared. These are not scaled. Um, you can go to using a plane wave, but in that case, you get a um, qualitatively different profile of the photonization cross section with respect to the experiment. In order to get a good agreement, you need a Coulomb wave with z is equal to one, which makes sense if you consider that when you ionize helium, you end up with a plus one charge on helium, and that plus one charge is going to affect your photoelectron spectrum. If you go to molecules, however, neither plane wave nor Coulomb wave with zero equals to one works, but some effective Coulomb wave, some effective charge works. Um, this we've, we've tried this for multiple molecules and we keep trying for more molecules now in my lab. We keep seeing that this turns out to be true. The problem is how to figure out what the Z effective is. Um, and that's something that I won't go into at the moment, um, but we do know that it's not extremely straightforward. It's not just being able to look at the molecule and figuring it out that all alcohols have the same Z effective or all the um, uh, aldehydes have the same Z, elective, uh, Z effective. It's more complicated. What about anisotropies? Well, look at the low energy regime. It makes a very big difference if you use a Coulomb wave or a plane wave. Um, in fact, even with you, when you change the partial charge in the Coulomb wave, you get very different profiles, um, qualitatively different profiles down here. However, when you go to the high energy regime, you're no longer that sensitive to the charge of the core because fast electrons are, are less sensitive to um, the cationic potential um, that they interact with when they're energetic. And therefore for high energy regime, it's um, less risky to worry about what kind of waves you end up using. All right. Um, now, this is something that um, we've been looking at only recently is using a multi-center approach. Um, use this thought experiment to think about it. If you have two inf infinitely separated molecules and um, you want to place the center of the Dyson orbital at some location, where do you put it? If you place it at the center of the Dyson orbital, well, the Dyson orbitals are delocalized. So this is the center of the, of the Dyson orbital. And clearly that's not the right place to place the center, the origin of the electron. You're saying that the electron is getting ejected in the space between the two electrons. And that of course gives you a qualitatively incorrect um, angular distribution as well. Whereas, if you um, think about the localized picture, then you get the right answer, right? So this prompted us to think we need to use a multi-center approach and compute the cross sections from each center independently. Um, but now the question is, what is what if those molecules are close together? Um, so we looked at a pentamer. Um, we also had experimental data um, thanks to collaboration with um, with all of um, these folks down here. Um, uh, that um, allowed us to think about how do we treat the photoelectron wave function in a situation like this in the condensed phase. In the gas phase, um, we obviously uh, just place the center here and that's not a problem, but in the liquid phase, we could place it at the centroid of the delocalized molecular orbital, or we can localize the Dyson orbital, meaning we, place the wave function at the center of each orbital and allow it only to interact with the, Dyson, the part of the Dyson orbital that is local to that atom or molecule. So here we use the multi-center approach for each water molecule, but you could just as well do it for each atom as well. Um, and with this picture, with the delocalized picture, we got an incorrect result. With the localized picture, when accounting for scattering using an empirical correction, we got the correct um, structure or the right angular distribution of the photoelectrons. Um, this is, by the way, the, was the best case scenario. The other two orbitals did not agree quite as well, but we got qualitatively um, the correct result as well. So the, the, the answer to this, what happens when the two molecules are close together? The answer is it actually depends on the energy. In the high energy regime, you need to use a multi-center approach because the electron only samples the local environment of each molecule. 
But when you use a large, um, uh, or rather a small energy um, ionizing radiation, your electron kinetic energy is small. It actually has to do with the de Broglie wavelength of the outgoing electron. When that de Broglie wavelength is larger than the interatomic distance or intermolecular distance between the molecules, then a single center approach we think may be the more correct picture. We're still working on this. We're still developing it. We're thinking about how to improve it to be able to connect the high energy regime with the low energy regime. So this is work very much in progress. Um, then you need the K grid, which tells you which energies you want to compute the angular distributions or the cross sections that. So um, then you can change where you want to place the wave origin and the charge on each center if you use a multi-center approach. So you can place a center on each atom and place different charges on these atoms. Averaging is another important decision you have to make. Um, for specific cases where you care about an aligned molecule, you don't want to use any averaging at all. But typically, for most experiments where you have an ensemble of randomly um, oriented samples, you want to average either numerically or analytically. We recommend using the analytical um, uh, averaging because it's fast. It gives you the partial wave expansion as an analytical tool, and it's available for a plane and Coulomb wave. However, sometimes you might need to use the numerical integration because this avoids truncating the plane wave wave function at an L max. So you use the full expression for the photoelectron wave function and not the truncated um, expansion. And that is necessary when you don't have selection rules applying and when you have problematic uh, high energy cases um, where, where you get high energy or high angular momentum contributions to the photoelectron wave. You also need your ionization energy. This is important for quantitative cross sections, but you can get away with not putting something quantitative here if you want to just look at the angular distributions because this doesn't affect your angular distributions. Laser polarization is only something you need when you don't perform any averaging. The grid options allows you to um, control the fineness of the grid used for numerical integration. Usually you don't want to play with this unless you check your norm as integrated on the grid and that's not close to one. If it's close to one, you're good. Um, if it's not close to one, you need to modify this grid. Typically, it's either because you're looking at a core orbital where you need a finer grid to capture the in the orbital because it's very small or because your molecule is just too large or somewhere outside the grid. Finally, job parameters. Um, you have to think carefully about which transition you want to use in order to, so in the case of carbon monoxide, for example, you might remember we requested an A1 state and a B1 state. This is requesting the um, ionization for the B1 state. These degeneracy factors are important to get quantitative, um, quantitatively correct cross sections because um, when you have degeneracies, like in the case of the pi orbitals of carbon monoxide, you need to multiply by two for the two pi orbitals that are degenerate, but you also need to multiply by two again for closed shell systems where you have two electrons in each orbital. Finally, in the basis section, this is automatically generated by, by um, the script, so I won't go into it. Um, then you get your molecular orbital printout. Here again, they remind you which transitions you have. So when you're choosing your um, Dyson MO transition, if you're not sure what to choose, scroll down and check which orbital you want. Um, and these are the norms of the Dyson orbitals printed here. The output, I'll skip through some of the parts that you might not need. Um, this gives you the analytical tool in order to, to understand where your partial waves are coming from. So this is only when you use a partial wave expansion. This gives you the contribution from each angular momentum number. So this is telling you that you have a S wave and a D wave, but P wave doesn't contribute very much, neither does the F wave. So um, that, that's telling you that the orbital of, of carbon monoxide in the state is P-like, at least, it, which makes sense because it's a pi orbital. Now, when you go to the total cross sections down here, 
um, you have your energies and your cross sections. This is what you want typically if you're looking for absolute cross sections. And at the end, you have your beta anisotropies. Those total cross sections should match with this if you're using averaging. If you're not using averaging, only trust those values. I think it doesn't even print those values, so you should be good. Um, and finally, there's a way to combine Frank Condon factors with the um, uh, with the cross sections. It's using the um, cross section FCF script, which is provided with Easy Dyson. I won't go into it, um, but essentially, it's, it's, the, the, instru the exact instructions are in the manual. So um, let me. I realize I probably went <laughs> over time, so. Um, I will leave up this summary um, and I'll, I'll just say for easy FCF, um, there's, um, these are all the input parameters. These are what the options you have and these are the output um, that you get from these software. This easy suite, we called it an easy suite because we're hoping eventually that we can keep adding new tools to the suite, um, which for different properties we can do post uh, quantum mechanical calculations to be able to simulate various properties in spectra. So the, this is hopefully something that we're we're thinking more easy stuff, in other words. Um, and future developments for easy FCF um, would be to extend this to larger systems to make it easier to be able to handle um, issues with um, cases where you don't have a strong overlap between your normal modes of the ground of, of your initial and final state, and uh, to include fibronic effects beyond the Condon approximation. In Easy Dyson, we're working on the multi-center treatment, and we're hoping to extend this to other spectroscopies as well. Let me quickly end with um, acknowledgments. Um, this is by no means my own work. This has been um, something that existed even when I, when I I before I joined um, Anna's group, I just um, basically joined and, and, and took these codes and, and tried to update them and, and add new implementations in them. So these are the new versions of these codes. Um, the original code version of Easy FCF was uh, by Vadim, and um, we're getting help from uh, Pavel, who is um, who keeps um, um, the code now updated. So um, this is for Easy FCF. For Easy Dyson, there have been a, a large number of people who, who have been involved, um, including um, Melania is the one who originally developed um, Easy Dyson. And we've gotten a lot of help from um, Ginny and Ilya for parallelization of the code, et cetera. And as usual, for, for a lot of technical issues. Um, we um, have contributions for, to the Easy Dyson manual from Nastya, Kadir, and Sahil. Um, Nastia implemented, well, along with Tomic, uh, implemented the Dyson orbital implementation in QCAM. And we're really grateful for all the people who helped us validate the code with giving us really interesting experiments and test cases to challenge us to, to keep improving the code. This includes all the angular distribution um, work with, in collaboration with um, Professor Bradford. Um, a lot of help from um, Professor Osborne, who um, uh, helped us with um, knowing which experiments to compare against. Um, Professor Stanton and uh, Takatoshi have helped us um, with understanding which factors we want to use um, as to, to multiply our cross sections. We thank everyone who also provided feedback, additional conversion scripts. Um, there's a publication that is now, the preprint is available on Anna's website. I encourage you um, to go check it out. Hopefully, um, if you see, see this in the future, this is already out. And um, when you use these tools, you can cite this paper. Um, and our hope is uh, this is the start of a uh, bigger project. Finally, last but not least, um, big thanks to uh, Dr. Anna Krilov, of course, who uh, basically led the project and started it and initiated it and hired me and, as a postdoc and allowed me to work on this exciting work. Um, thank you to all of the Prillo group, many of them who used Easy um, Suite uh, codes and gave feedback and contributed through scripts and other ways. Um, thanks to many members of my group, um, Elvis Pablo, Rebecca, Mahboub, and, and Jorge all used um, Easy FCF. Um, Rebecca, Mahboub, and, and Jorge have used Easy Dyson, and um, 
Mahbub and Jorge have helped me um, to think about this multi-center or rather to, to test this multi-center approach um, recently um, for funding. We're grateful to DOE and NSF um, for the development and support of Easy Spectra on the Krilov group side and a lot of the applications that we're doing. Um, so we're thinking about moving towards photoelectron circular dichroism, which we're grateful to ACSDRF for um, that new direction that we're, we're headed towards. And the NSF, which is, um, we're looking at um, Flavin um, project is funded by them. And um, Flavin is where we're using easy um, FCF a lot these days to try to understand um, why the origin of, of this um, large shift between the vertical and adiabatic um, excitation energies. And with that, I'll leave this up. And I'm sorry I took over time. So I will stop now. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Samma, for this wonderful talk and uh, sharing this very nice spectroscopy simulation to, uh, to us. Uh, let's see the questions. Uh, we have already got uh, several questions. Let's be quick. So, first of all, uh, what's the simplest way to get values of vertical adiabatic energy? Uh, this means, uh, do we need to give special keywords in QCAM input? I was muted. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I, I didn't. Uh, what, what's the simplest way to get a values of vertical adiabatic energy? Uh, I, I think the, uh, 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 he or she want to know, uh, is it necessary to give special keywords in QCAM input to get uh, vertical adiabatic energy? That's a, a great question. So vertical um, is probably the easiest to get. So that's why people like to use vertical because it is simple. You just optimize the initial state and calculate the electronic excitation energy and you get your um, excited state. And it really is tempting to say that that is going to be corresponding to your lambda max. In a lot of cases it is, um, but for polyatomic molecules, um, a lot of times it also, isn't right because um, let me go back to this picture. Whoops, too far. Um, so in the case of um, phenolate, for example, it really um, isn't because you get a lot of um, the displacement is along very small normal modes um, that don't contribute a lot to the splitting, and you don't have a very large displacement along the um, main uh, progression forming frank condon factors. And that tends to be the case in, in quite a few um, molecules. And, and the same is true for, um, well, easy FCF. Um, the most intense peak, at least in the protein, is not the adiabatic or, or the vertical one. Um, so, yeah, you, you have to be careful with this. Now, with adiabatic, what you need to do is optimize the uh, target state excited or ionized state and then look at that energy and compare it with your initial state energy so that's the way to do it there's no automated way to do it although i wouldn't be against um, implementing a way to just automatically compute that value if requested but um it, it just probably um can, can take an easy script to do it um whereas this you need vibrational frequencies as well so um that's a, even more work to compute this so it's not automated. It's something you 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 would need to um, run at least two jobs here, and um, optimization plus frequency um, jobs for for the adiabatic zero zero. Uh, okay. So uh, so the second question for easy FCF. What is the maximum system size possible uh, for calculation? For example, I want to calculate uh, this for a flavin molecule. Is that possible? Yeah, uh, that's an extra question. So this is flavin, and um, we did compute it. Um, Pablo computed it uh, in my group, and it wasn't easy. <laughs> But um, the, the thing we struggled with is methyl group rotation. So it's 
not so much about the size, it's about the flexibility of your system. If you have a flexible system with many rotating parts, then you could get in trouble pretty easily. Um, if you have a rigid molecule, even if it's a large one, um, in some cases, for example, for, for the, um, we, we also computed this not only for the ground state, uh, oxidized state of flavin, we computed it for all the different um, redox states of flavin as well. Um, for the um, hydroquinone state, which is the fully reduced state, the flavin is no longer planar, it becomes bent. And that gave us a bit of trouble. We even had to chop off the methyl groups in order to be able to simulate the spectrum. And even then, we couldn't simulate it very well. We, we couldn't get our um, trans condom factors to add up to one, putting it that way. Um, so yeah, um, the, the limitation is not so much size, it's flexibility. That's why we're hoping to, to work around that somehow. And we have a few ideas that we're, we're gonna be trying out. Okay, good. So the third uh, question is, I used the easy spectrum before, but I'm not a spectroscopist. Can you say why the energies in the output are always printed as negative numbers? <laughs> that is a very good question. And um, I actually had, well, uh, I'll show you one of the things because this is, something that we, we wanted to quickly put out. Um, and <laughs> these were my comments that I was um, thinking about to myself. And one of the questions, I don't know if you can see my screen, one of the questions I asked myself is, why are we printing them as, as negative values? <laughs> so yeah, um, good question. Uh, I, I think the, the original purpose of, of EZ um, spectrum was to calculate photoionization spectra and the IP could have been provided as a negative value. And I think that was the idea, um, but this is outdated and I, I, I probably will be updating that to print positive values instead. Okay, so next question is, what is the pure cause in EZ Dyson? Um, um, uh, yes, yeah, I didn't explain that. Um, so, yeah. Pure CART is the ch choice of using pure or Cartesian basis functions. So pure means um, there are five D orbitals, seven F orbitals, um, et cetera. And um, Cartesian means that you use the um, six D functions rather than five. So instead of having um, the ones that you know from let's say general chemistry, which are DZ squared, dx squared minus y squared, et cetera. You, you use dxy, dyz, dzy, um, so six combinations, yeah. Yes, okay. So uh, another question. Thank you for the interesting talk. Does the program calculate excited state, a critical points like a, a conic intersection, burial, et cetera? I believe, I, I believe not. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, th that's not, so that would be within QCAM. Yes, the QCAM does, um, certainly. Um, easy Dyson and, and Easy SCF. Well, Easy SCF, um, conical intersections by definition are far from equilibrium. So that's not something you would want to use Easy SCF for. Now, um, one point about Easy Dyson, one of the things that we're excited with uh, about having this kind of user-friendly code, it's actually been implemented into or integrated into Newton X um, by um, uh, Barbati and, and uh, Mario Barbati and co-workers. And um, you could run excited state dynamics and look at the evolution of the wave function of the system as a function of time. And in that sense, you could use Easy Dyson in order to simulate either cross sections or even I think more excitingly, angular distributions of electrons as a function of um, dynamics and, and see how your orbital um, changes shape. And if you, you can probably see this experimentally, there have been several demonstrated examples um, by, by multiple groups. I know um, Dr. Dan Newmark is, is one of them. Um, uh, and um, yeah, so so you're able to 
to follow the evolution of the electronic structure as a function of time with, with that approach. And then you can compute at, at a conical intersection, yes, with easy Dyson. Okay. Uh, next question, what, what is the size of the system that can normally be calculated by these two programs? I think this has been mostly uh, car covered by the answer to yeah. uh, the previous question. The key issue sure. is not the size, but uh, the flexibility of the molecule. Yeah. Okay. And I can just say with Easy Dyson, it doesn't make much of a difference what size you have because it's numerical integration. So um, yeah. it, it shouldn't make a huge difference, but um, yeah, uh, I'll okay. just say that. It doesn't scale exponentially, at least, I don't think. <laughs> okay, the next question. Does easy FCM, FCF only restrict to uh, Frank, uh, Frank quantum factors, or can it also consider vibronic terms coming from a non a uh, negligible first derivative of the dipole moment uh, with respect to some normal mode. I guess it's, it's uh, this is about the uh, uh, Dachinsky uh, rotation under under uh, higher uh, terms, right? Uh, high order terms. Well, yeah, in a, in a sense, I think um, yeah, that, that's pretty much. One way to do it. I also know that there are people who do Harrisburg Teller, I think is, is what what it is that includes the change in the transition dipole moment as a function of um, the um, the geometry. So we don't have that and and one of the future developments we're thinking of is exactly that. So including non condon um, effects. Okay. Currently, no. <laughs> So, uh, next question. What's the uh, time cost for AT atom system, typical time? Um, is this easy FCF or easy Dyson, I wonder? So, for, for easy FCF, um, it's actually not that bad. So, easy FCF, um, I know Flavin, which is 31. Well, actually, I, I uh, have to take that back. So for Flavin, it depends on your how you make your approximation. So you probably definitely want to truncate at a smaller value for, whoops, where is that, easy FCF, um, for these max vibrational excitations, et cetera. You want to truncate at, at some reasonable value where you don't get crazy um, expensive calculations. It actually scales quite badly as you increase the number of um, excitations and the target state. So it gets worse and worse. The other thing is um, Dushinsky takes more time than parallel. So parallel is definitely easier, but the question is whether parallel would actually work for your um, for an AT atom system. For easy Dyson, um, the EOM Dyson orbital calculation is the time consuming part. Um, that probably is, is not easy to do for an 80 atom system, um, at least not with a, with a large enough base set. Um, but with you can do it with molecular orbitals, and I think it's perfectly doable and easy Dyson then it should be. Okay, so next, how to compute the FDF when the target cationic state has strong spin orbital coupling? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, how to calculate FCF when the target cationic system has uh, cationic state has strong spin orbital coupling? Uh, strong, what kind of orbital coupling? Just strong orbital coupling? Uh, strong spin orbital coupling. Uh, spin orbital coupling, okay. Um, yeah. Good question. I'm not sure. So if if you mean, yeah, I'm I'm not entirely sure. Um, there is a spin orbit coupling code in in QChem, um, and you can. Um, I I don't know how well it allows you to calculate the frequency um, within that um, implementation, 
and of course there, there's no uh, you're still going to be using your your um, content approximation so your transition dipole moment is assumed not to change so there's no coupling between the initial state and the target state but um, if, if your target state is um, a spin orbit coupled with a higher state, I, I think you, you still should be able to get the vibrational frequencies and still be able to do easy FCF, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I think this uh, spin orbital coupling should be hand handled by the quantum chemistry uh, pro program Absolutely. you use. Yeah, not a, not, a, not an easy Dyson and an easy FCF, right? Yeah. Anyway. Exactly right. So uh, last question. Sorry, sorry for the time uh, limit. Uh, thanks for the nice webinar. Does Easy Dyson work for strong field ionization? Um, so I think uh, Dr. Krilov has been working on this, but um, at the moment, I I don't believe so. Yeah. I'm okay. wrong though. Okay, we are uh, uh, running out of time. Actually, we are over time. So uh, let's uh, thank uh, Summer again. And uh, uh, let me show. Yes, uh, if you have more questions, uh, then we cannot uh, comment any more questions at this time. But if you have more questions, you can pose. Sorry, uh, you can post them uh, on our forum. Just go to our website uh, under the learn menu, go to our QCAM talk forum. And I made a, a post. If you have more questions, just put in the, the questions uh, in the post. And uh, sure. yeah, either uh, Summer or uh, some of uh, our staff team will uh, answer the question. So, I think uh, that's all for today's webinar and uh, hope to see you in next webinar. Thanks again. This concludes our webinar. We also invite you to visit us on Facebook. Thank you for your participation and see you at the next webinar.